Welcome to the Low Carb Conferences podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Gerber. And today our special guest is Dr. Roshni Sagani, who is an endocrinologist, the founder and CEO of Rasan Health, soon to be author, and also a sponsor of our Low Carb Conferences YouTube channel. So how's it going today? Thank you, Jeff. You know, I'm doing great. We're sitting in Mumbai and you're in Denver. So I love how technology has got us all connected. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's always a challenge with the uh, 12 and a half hour time dis- difference to connect. But here we are. Yes. So a little more about the doctor. Dr. Roshni was born in the U.S., but now resides in Mumbai with her family. She went to medical school in India, then came back to the U.S., where she trained and received her board certification in endocrinology and internal medicine. Now, with over 15 years of clinical experience, she is not your typical specialist, as her focus addresses better health and less medication through lifestyle changes. And that's truly her hashtag. Through Rasan Health, Roshni offers remote coaching programs to clients addressing hormone imbalance, weight management, thyroid, diabetes, metabolism, and more. Although her programs cater to the Asian Indian population worldwide, and yes, there are some unique challenges in this population, I believe many others can benefit from her knowledge and passion. So Roshni, if you can tell us some more about yourself, including your background, passions, research, the future, and more. Oh, my goodness. Wow. You, you're going to have to stop me when you want me to stop talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, uh, we can take our time. You know, we have 45 minutes to an hour to get into it. I know Great. we've always enjoyed our conversations. Yes, yes. And that's always a good sign when you sort of feel like time stops and you're just sharing ideas and meeting somebody who's got a kindred spirit, a kindred wavelength. Um And I think we all feel that in the lifestyle medicine space that maybe now we're sort of finding each other coming out of the woodwork and realizing that maybe the last 10 years where we were breaking away from mainstream medicine, we weren't alone. And I think that's the beautiful part that you all have created is this community and, you know, knowledge sharing platforms. So it's great to be here. Um, My journey started just the normal, traditional way. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to help people. And before I realized it, unknowingly, I was in the same sort of, you know, rut of diabetes, for example, with an endocrinology practice. Diabetes becomes a very big part of what you see every day. And uh, you got these people who were struggling, blood reports are not getting better, and they come to us as the last stop in medical care is this is the most trained doctor for diabetes. And my, my job was prescribe more medication. I I didn't have any other tools and I just started to feel a bit handicapped. I've always been interested in mind body medicine, but I couldn't really, my training didn't help me put those two concepts together. So they stayed in buckets for a long time. And, you know, I mentioned this in my diet doctor interview with Brett was there was this one man who just would not agree to get started on insulin when his HbA1c was 16% in spite of four or five different oral medications for for diabetes. And yeah, and I was like, I can't force this on somebody. He's saying no. And sort of the one thing that helped me was with all this international moving, you know, I had moved continents, you know, at the age of 10, again, at the age of 23, again, at the age of 33, these US India moves, where when I came to India at the age of 33, I wanted to be the educator for my Indian patients because what normally happens is the endocrinologist, when I was practicing in the U.S. or in India, for that matter, when you prescribe your medication, you may also prescribe education, which is done by somebody else. And I was coming from the U.S. to India in 2011, where there was this sort of black box where behind the education door, I don't know what happens with my patient. I don't want another black door when I move to India where I'm so disconnected because I need to relearn what India is about, what diabetes in India is about, what are the lifestyles and cultures. So I figured the best way to do that was to be the educator and bridge that gap. And so I ended up, when this man said no to insulin, the endocrinologist in me was stuck, but the educator in me had options. And I realized I have to sort of blend it now. And I said, well, then can we talk about your carbs? If you don't want more insulin and your sugar is really high, let's talk about your food. 
And sure enough, when we started looking at that, he was very motivated. He was not a stubborn, difficult patient. I think doctors, you know, get caught up in when they don't know what to do. We sometimes project it onto the patient and the patient's in your office because they want help. They want help. They're not there to waste their time or their money. So we need to get the doctor out of the equation and serve the person in front of us. And I think I was forced into that situation that day. And that just unleashed a whole low carb idea in my head. Was this patient uh, knowledgeable about diet and nutrition at that point? Not at all. He was, a, he is, you know, he's vegetarian. He eats, well, I don't know if you've been exposed to Indian food, but there are these like chapatis, these wheat flatbreads, something like a tortilla, like a wheat tortilla. And you call it chapati, you call it roti, thin ones. And he would eat about eight to 10 of those a day, about four to five of them per meal. Wow. Yeah. Chapati, non roti, rice. Yeah. Yeah, just carbs on top of carbs on top of carbs and uh, on top of and vegetable oils. And, and we can talk <laughs> about that as well. So, you know, uh, that is un- somewhat unique but to the, the Indian culture and population, uh, vegetarianism. But then again, it's not. And then, of course, we have the Indian population or the Asian population living all over the world. So, you know, um, they get they get they get westernized and um that's great that he was uh you know very open I, why was he resistant to insulin <laughs> yeah you know that's a really good question he had see, so unfortunately diabetes is widespread in india and you you know generally you've seen somebody suffer and if you have been around from like the 70s 80s 90s he had seen people go downhill and you know it's a timing thing where if somebody's got an a1c that's not doing well on tablets and you give them insulin this person was not doing well with diabetes anyway so things were falling apart but people sort of noticed that timestamp of the person got worse after they started insulin right and so is it helping is it hurting and yeah. I, if I go on insulin, am I going to be on it for life? I could understand uh, his fears. Yeah, but, and he uh, didn't see any get better. He didn't see anybody in his lay language. He wasn't a scientific man. He was a normal lay person. But he's like, I never saw anybody get better once they got on insulin. So he was like, no. Yeah, that's that's mostly true. I would agree with that. You yeah. know, Dr. Mariella Gallant, who is the other uh, endocrinologist in the low carb community. And I, I always uh, bug both of you to collaborate. Uh, has a great story where uh, they used to call her the the Lantis Queen. So when Lantis came out during her training, all she wanted to do was put everybody on Lantis. And now all she wants to do is get everybody off Lantis, deprescribe less medication, and work on nutrition like yourself. Yeah, I need to meet her. And the same thing has happened with me. The same is we, uh, it's probably everywhere where you get invited by pharma companies to give these talks to doctors about how to prescribe. And the endocrinologist is usually sitting on top of that chain of diabetes prescribers in terms of education, qualification, a new drug comes out, we're the ones invited to talk about it. I I fell for that, you know, I, I was in that for a long time. I fell for, you know, so a lot of transformation to be honest is I've eaten lots and lots of those Indian wheat flatbreads myself. I've, I've eaten rice. I've eaten everything um, every day. Uh, and I've been the prescriber of insulin and multiple daily injections, mix 50 injections for type 2 diabetes, explaining the rationale. And, you know, I've actually stood on stage and said things like, because we have this high carb diet, we need 50 50. We need 50 long acting and 50 short acting insulin to cover the carbs in the diet and my bulb was just not going off is why are we using this as our only hammer you know it's like you you only have one tool in your toolbox is prescribed but i've done the same thing so i can relate to uh what you're describing is we we go 180 if your eyes open you can't unsee it anymore you know and you just need to do the whole 180 and feel okay with yourself yeah so you know what happened with this uh, patient 
he wanted the options. So when we negotiated, you know, and I realized this is now a negotiation, is if I offer him to hold my pen in, and, you know, who was I fooling? Even if I were to write insulin on a piece of paper, he's not bound to do what I've written down. So I was being realistic is I can see that you really clearly want to avoid insulin. Here's one thing we should try. I want to see you back next week. I wasn't okay with a three-month follow-up with something so uncontrolled. I was like, let's meet again. And he saw that I was genuinely listening to him. So he did come back. You know, sometimes the patient never comes back. This man came back and guess what? His blood sugars. So I have data from him where when he was eating four chapatis, his post-meal glucose was 240. And when he cut those four chapatis down to two, his glucose, post-meal glucose, he kept the vegetables and the dal the same. His post-meal glucose came down to 91. Wow. And it was so profound that I put that slide up in my educational talks now, whether it's to doctors or to patients, and I make people guess. I'm like, guess how much his glucose dropped just by cutting four chapatis to two, and everybody's jaw drops. Nobody's guessing 91. Everybody's saying maybe 200, 150, 180. We're never expecting that kind of profound drop, but guess what? That's what happened to this man. He was very convinced. He told me that if two chapatis can be this effective, I'm going down to one. I want you to reduce my other five tablets that I'm on. So he was telling me, he was calling the shots in his care in terms of what he's willing to do with nutrition and therefore what I needed to do with his medication. Wow. And so I'm guessing he was um, had a fairly typical, uh, you know, appearance where he was um, metabolically unhealthy, but not particularly overweight. Yes, he was thin, actually. So his face was thin. His arms and legs were slim and the Indian, you know, stomach coming out. So we call it a paunch in India, where it's that little bit of a belly, small. But overall, people accept that as part of normal progression into your 40s and beyond, that that's normal. And but that's what type 2 diabetes looks like in India very often. You don't have to get very overweight before getting uncontrolled diabetes. Yes, a little punch. And, you know, uh, the Asian population, the Indian population, they travel around the world. They come to the U.S. and they go into the doctor's office and they're not particularly concerned that they have metabolic disease or they're diabetic because outwardly they look okay. And. So we have the term, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, TOFI, where you're thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And that's that's fairly typical. You really need to check the the, the metabolic markers in, in most of your patients, both in India and around the world. And, you know, frankly, I would say you are a little bit crazy to uh, want to take on a patient with a hemoglobin A1C of uh, 16. So for our audience... A normal A1C is, say, under 6%. And for me, the alarm goes off in my head when I see patients with A1Cs over 10. And um, I think the audience needs to understand that there is a role for insulin. Insulin isn't poison. In fact, when it was discovered, it saved lives. But the problem today is that we often overprescribe uh, insulin, not in this case. And then patients get on insulin and then they eat as much chapati or, 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 or carb, whatever they want, and then they just t- chase it with insulin. But the appropriate use of insulin is when um, you've really lost pancreatic beta cell function and you're not uh, producing insulin. I, I hope you uh, agree with me. But, you know, we, we um, talk to patients about a short course of insulin when their A1C is over 10. And yet you are very bold to take on this patient. Kudos. Well, he refused, you know, he refused. I was I was stuck. And so it forced me to do something else because he was willing to walk out that door with no insulin prescription, you know, so I had to keep him there and do something. So that's where the treatment plan changed. Um, and I agree. And so what we do in our practice is we do the C-peptide test because you're so right, as uh, of course, with endocrinology, we see people with type 1 diabetes and insulin is life-saving for them. But overuse of a good thing can become a bad thing, even in type 1 and in type 2, where too much insulin can be a problem. So we look at the C-peptide level to decide whether this person genuinely has working pancreas function or not. 
Um, and just to sort of put the awkward spin on this with the normal BMI Indian who's completely metabolically sick, one of the funny pushbacks we get is because outwardly this person looks thin and because Indian culture, maybe other cultures also decide whether the meal was substantial enough based on the portion of rice or roti that you took. If we start negotiating reducing that, family goes up in arms saying, this person's already so thin, how can you reduce their nutrition? Carbohydrates are energy giving foods and where will they get all their energy from? So that just brings you into this whole can of worms of misrepresentation of what we need for a healthy body composition. Yes, and so it, it, there are some unique challenges and I have learned over the years, I, I, I went to uh, uh, medical school training with uh, foreign medical graduates like yourself from India. I have a lot of Indian friends who live in the US. I play tennis with a lot of friends from India and they've shared with me over the years. And um, well, some of the unique challenges are, as you say, um, uh, they are uniquely opposed to consuming animal products and saturated fat, and uh, more so than what, what I typically see here in the U.S., that um, almost as if it's a religion that we have to eat carbs to, to be healthy, as you say. And, um, you know, uh, there are vegetarians, there are some that eat chicken. Uh, I always joke that uh, the ones who drink, eat the chicken um, are different than the ones who don't eat the chicken, but they drink the beer. <laughs> what my tennis buddies were telling me. Exactly. Yeah. You can, with, when it's your friend, you can definitely sort of call out that paradox is how, what religion allows you to do that, but not this. You know, and it's a tricky subject. It's a deeply <clears throat> personal subject. And, you know, there's no right or wrong here. <clears throat> I think it's definitely harder to achieve sufficient protein, a good quality amino acid profile with the plant based or vegetarian uh, preference. Uh, so it's very hard. It's very, very hard. I see so much of sarcopenia, people trying to bust it out in the gym and uh, expect gains in the, in the gym, but they're just not getting the protein. So while it's right that there's a religious sort of angle to avoiding animal products, you're so true. What else will they eat is, oh, the other thing that catches Indians in, on their, you know, trips them up is there's a huge tendency for spice. So the vegetables and the vegetarian protein in terms of dals, for example, is so spicy. If you reduce your carb to dilute that spice factor, you're looking at eating very spicy food with a spoon which will just, you know, you'll be in a full sweat. You'll have like gastric distress from the spice levels in your mouth. So that's a huge shift and pushback is how will I eat this by, all by itself? People don't understand. It's a very different concept for them to change the way they season their food. Yeah, so I, I certainly uh, in, enjoy my spice. And um, yeah, the other pushback is the uh, the the vegetable oils, and I know that the vegetable oils, uh, which which we believe to be inflammatory, uh, are, are one of the worst products in India. Yes. You know, and we actually started with ghee in the north and coconut oil in the south. We had that. That was our traditional uh, cooking medium we, that was accepted in homes, you know. But the Industrial Revolution came, the West went into it. India copied what the West was doing, and we went into this um, sort of food pyramid idea of carbs at the base. We, we're all doing what the West was doing. And so the processed oils, refined oils, have now become a big marketing thing where outside hospitals on bus stops, you'll see ads for heart-healthy sunflower oil, heart-healthy rice bran oil, and it's just everywhere. They're spending big money. So I, I think we did have cold pressed oil. That was the tradition is the cows and buffaloes are harnessed. They walk around in circles with this wooden sort of, you know, log apparatus behind them. And they are grinding, cold pressing peanut oil, mustard oil, you know, the local oils that is there, just cold pressing it out. And that's it. You just pour it and you use it in the house. That was how traditionally if you were from the Northeast, you were making mustard oil cold pressed. 
you know, like I said, the, the um, there's another one, which is the other one, mustard, coconut, peanut. These are like the top, oh, sesame. So these are cold pressed sesame where it's first extract, not refined in a chemical way in the, in the factories. Um, and ghee and coconut oil were primary, but we got marketed out of those into these bottled refined oils. So, so what's wrong with heat pressing, chemical pressing? What's wrong with uh, the polyunsaturated oils? Yeah, so, you know, we've gone up full circle, I think, with the whole um, heart diet, heart hypothesis. When we had to demonize saturated fat, we had, we had to demonize dietary cholesterol. And so keys, right? The whole sort of controversy that erupted there was we were told that saturated fat is the problem and that polyunsaturated is good. And now, fast forward 30, 40 years, we're realizing those are probably creating this omega-3, omega-6 imbalance where you have too many reactive species of the fats, which are then getting into the system and sitting inside the blood vessel wall. So now Ben Bickman, I think in his book, he talks about the linoleic and linolenic acid getting deposited into your blood vessel being super inflammatory. Those are the omega-6 oils sitting inside your blood vessels. So the omega-3, omega-6 ratio has dropped with the way we've taken these oils in. Yeah. So it's like a structural thing that make them particularly inflammatory in, in the blood. And, um, you know, the, the whole reversal is that, you know, at least in the low-carb community, we, we see evidence to demonstrate that the um, the stable fats in the blood are monounsaturated mono, uh, and saturated fat. Right. So olive oil is the mono and then the ghee and the coconut are the uh, saturated ones. And, you know, it's welcoming, you know, to see that people are happy to go back to their traditional cooking fats, the home ones. Well, what I like in, in mainstream, even cardiology, they, they do agree that monounsaturated fats are, are better and healthier. And uh, they seem to be slightly going in that direction. Do you agree? Yes, slowly. I've been bugging my technology <laughs> friends for a while that, you know, are we doing the right thing focusing just on LDL? Are we doing the right thing? You know, and the AHA has already retracted itself from dietary cholesterol where egg yolks are okay. But the world has been so marketed to be scared of egg yolks that everybody thinks egg whites are the right choice. So I'm doing the healthy thing by eating an egg white omelet and I have to stop them because they say it so fast. I'm like, wait. Why do you do egg whites? What makes you do that? No, I was told about my LDL. So getting cardiology people, you know, and the whole statin thing, you know, we, we would spend a whole hour on, on talking about whether we should do statins or not, or is everybody supposed to be on statins for f preventing the first heart attack or first stroke? That's a huge can of worms. But I think more cardiologists are coming on board and hopefully in their conferences, somebody is pioneering the way we are seeing in our general medicine or in our family practice or in endocrine conferences, people are pushing back. I'm hoping that more cardiologists are talking and able to get a voice. Yeah, well, it's it's a great, great to hear this coming from you. And um, I've been at it for doctoring for almost uh, 35 years and 25 of those was low carb. And so, you know, as you said in the beginning, uh, you've seen a lot of per progress in the last, say, 10 or 15 years, but we've seen a ton of progress in, in 25 years. So um, it's happy. I'm happy that we can reach out that uh, there is a big growing movement in India. There was a big uh, conference. I don't know if you're a part of, part of that, but uh, yes, we I have, was, yeah. uh, were you involved with that? Yes, yes. In fact, Shashi, uh, you know, was kind enough to sort of let me sort of kick off the whole thing uh, because the panel was so many low carb, big, big names from around the world that from speaking from the Indian voice, uh, I was able to start that kick off that meeting with him on day one and then be part of the closing on day three. And I think they put together a fantastic panel over three days. It was uh, people should watch it. It's I think it's called Metabolic Health India. And it's not just Indian speakers, it's everybody from around the world who you should be listening to for low carb. So it's a great lineup that they've got. And they sort of ask the speakers to give one message to the Indian audience. So it was a wonderful conference. Yeah, so it was a remote event and it's recorded and still available, right? Free on YouTube, yep. Great, well, maybe we can be sure and put a link to that. 
But um, excellent. Well, you know, getting back to the Indian population, so um, it is a challenge. And, you know, I recall uh, I've had several patients, in fact, a father and son, both really strict vegetarians, probably drinking a lot of beer. (laughs) But somehow they had discovered carnivore and, you know, they went from one extreme to the other and uh, switched over to um, a carnivore diet, uh, despite um, uh, the wife, the, the mother, who was re- reluctant and resistant, and their their metabolic health really improved. So it was pretty easy to get them to switch over. But how do you gently approach it with, um, you know, your population and to, um, you know, dispel my, some of the myths and warm them up to the idea that, you uh, uh, doing a low carb vegetarian or maybe introducing some animal protein. Yeah, so whether or not to introduce animal, I leave that in their hands. You know, it's such a touchy subject, and I've got so many fish to fry. I've got so many agenda that I need to work on with these clients. That what source they use for protein, I let them be the master of that because I'm looking for something sustainable, something that won't be a Bling of three months, where because I say so, add it, but it really rubs your mindset the wrong way. It's going against your decades of conditioning. I don't want to be the one, you know, nudging you that way until it comes from you. If it's coming from you, I will be more than happy to support if you want to go animal, because I know it's going to be so much easier to achieve your protein, get your amino acids in, and everything else, whether it is, you know, so Jeff, I go in order of let's work on nutrition. Let's work on sleep after that. Let's work on stress management after that. Let's work on exercise after that. And fifth sequence would be time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting. But I don't ever shift that, you know, sequence. So getting protein to target, whichever way you want, if it means. So one trade-off we might do, for example, is let's say they want to, st- and I'm a vegetarian. I would, If you pushed me against a wall and said, Roshni, you need to eat animal protein to get your protein to target. I would be uncomfortable myself. Okay, and I've eaten meat in my childhood. I grew up in the States. I continued to eat meat when I was young in India. And at the age of 15, I just decided that's it, I'm done. Um, Nobody told me to do that. It just came. You know, it just, it's one of these bizarre things that when you, when it's a belief, it's very difficult to get somebody out of a belief till they switch inside. And so I don't want to spend my energy battling that with the client. So what I'll do is if that's your belief and that's your value system, we will then make one trade off is not getting protein to target is not an option. So if you're going to stay plant based or, you know, maybe dairy is one thing you're willing to keep, we're going to add a protein supplement. We're going to have to add a protein shake, which we will then help you do label reading and check that it's not got 500, you know, highly processed additives. Because so many protein shakes have emulsifiers through refined oils, vegetable oils, you know, nasty additives of flavors, coloring, sugar, sugar substitutes. And then although you were taking that protein supplement for health to get your amino acids to target, you're not you're adding in like 49 other terrible things. So we make them look for a single ingredient protein supplement, whether it's whey or it's plant based. And that's one trade off that I've had to make is maybe if we're not going to do animal, one processed food we're going to have to take, since I would rather see you get everything from whole food. But if you were to take your protein from, let's say, dals or lentils or legumes, for 10 grams of protein that you'll get, you're going to get about 30 grams of carb from it. So it's difficult to stay low carb and get all of your protein from lentils and legumes. Plus, it's filling, it's all that fiber, it gets you really heavy in your gut. And so it's quite impossible for a vegetarian to reach a protein target without adding a one processed thing, which would be a protein shake. Yeah. So um, I'm hearing that um, you have had success with low carb vegetarianism. And, uh, you know, I do agree that, uh, you know, lentils, carbs can be filling in the right context. In, in the wrong context, they they sometimes do nothing. But I understand that, you know, adding having some carbs doing a low carb vegetarian it can be challenging but uh, you're having success so back to the guy at the beginning of the story where you cut out the chapati i imagine his a1c went down over time 
very much so. He came down over the next three to six months. We went from five pills to four to three to two. Finally, I was able to manage him on a combination of metformin and citagliptin. And we sort of got to a plateau point over there. This was, I'm talking 2013, 2014. I wasn't routinely doing C peptides on everybody. And I was still working within a hospital. I was in a hospital practice as an hospital-based endocrinologist. So I was a bit limited in what I was offering the client in terms of supporting their workouts, supporting fasting. Those were tools I started adding in the last decade. So we ended up reaching a steady state of he was his HbA1c came below seven on two medicines, the citagliptin and the metformin. Um, and yes, he added more of the pulses, the legumes, and I'm, I'm saying good things about pulses and legumes. They have complex carbs, whole unprocessed carbs, natural fiber, good things for your gut. Um, and he was able to increase that. He was able to increase his vegetable intake, dialing down the spice quotient and feel satisfied and full with those meals. And with the family seeing his diabetes numbers getting down, avoiding the insulin, it took some cultural shifting in the house to cook this way and feed him this way. But another thing I do is I actually just sit with the same menu that's there for the rest of the house is you guys are already making these rotis, these vegetables and these dolls. We're just going to make the quantity of each of them different where the carbs are going to be cut to 50 percent. We're going to double up on the dolls and double up on the vegetables. And so maybe one trick I end up doing is in India, you'll have these pairings of dal and rice or, um, you know, roti and dal. So all of them have carbs. So we're going to say get more of your carbs from the protein based ones, which is the legumes, and then dial down the roti and rice. So you're choosing a protein rich source as opposed to one that's mostly carb. Well, that, that's excellent. Um, I'm, I'm glad you're having success with him and others. And uh, now, it's interesting. Back then, you were working in the hospital, and you know the question now. I'd like to hear a little bit about Rasan Health, and if that is your only thing that that you do, re- remote uh, um, counseling with uh, patients, or are you doing some uh, in in person work? Are you doing any traditional endocrinology, or is that uh, a thing of the past? That's a great question. We are fully 100% online. I manage medications for people who are in India because my license is active here. I do the lifestyle coaching for people who are outside of India because they need to work with their local doctor to manage their prescriptions. And uh, so I would not take away from the requirement of their local physician for their medication management outside of India. Um, it's lifestyle focused programs only. So I've, I've dis- disconnected from being the primary person who would, let's say, deal with Cushing syndrome or, you know, a rare osteogenesis imperfecta or like a rare parathyroid tumor. I would leave that with the hospital based endocrinologists because my focus and specialization now has heavily become how do I support you in not just nutrition, but sleep, stress management, exercise and time restricted eating for metabolic health. That's become my forte. And I've been focusing exclusively on that for many years now. Yeah, that that's, um, that's fantastic. And um, I'm just wondering if there were any challenge challenges working in um, the healthcare system in, in India that uh, there was restrictions to what you could talk to patients about, what you could prescribe, what you could do? How, how was that? That's a great question. You know, India is very open to the idea of alternative medicine, you know. So allopathic medicine or conventional medicine is still in people's psyche here, a last resort, I would say. They will try homeopathy, naturopathy, Ayurveda, uh, you know, home remedies, they grandmother's recipes. They will try to do things on their own before going into taking pills and injections. So it's not that strange. You know, we also, we, India is the origin place of yoga. So people understand the idea of body, mind or breath work. Not not that we do it regularly. I don't think the whole country is doing yoga the way we were meant to, but uh, it's a very powerful thing we have. So, or the link between food and health, the Ayurvedic teachings of the link of how food can influence your body. Those sciences are culturally there for, have been there for centuries. 
So if I use the word food as medicine, it's not foreign to them, you know, because we're still dealing with home food. They they appreciate home food, you know, so they I, I think a lot of kitchens still cook every day in India. Most kitchens cook every day. So it's easy to say we're going to use the kitchen as the as the remedy, first remedy. Where maybe culturally we're still slow to get on board is maybe strength training. Um, it's picking up now. I mean, there are more, you know, messaging around, I think because the Indian actors and actresses have started becoming really muscular. So the cinema representation of muscle fitness as a beauty standard has come into the mainstream. So you see more teenagers talking about being fit and exercising and being well toned with muscle mass. So those are aspirational now, whereas before people were like, oh, I don't need to go to the gym. I'm not trying to do bodybuilding, you know, so that's evolving. Um, so the pushback is not strong when I use lifestyle. In fact, people appreciate it, I would say. If there's a way yeah. to be on less medicine, people love that. I, I meant to ask you about uh, exercise, movement, and activity, and I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, glad to hear that uh, that is uh, a push and also that it it seems that uh, there really isn't much pushback in your country because as you say they're they're open to uh you know alternative ideas such as eating real food if that's alternative i don't i don't get that but you know over the years for myself i i really didn't see any pushback i i just don't worry about that and over the 20 years i i've really had fun just uh you know, presenting this, uh, you know, alternative way of lifestyle and diet with their patients. So, so that's, that's great, Roshni. Um, the, um, the one thing I, you're an endocrinologist and I, we can't, um, stop the conversation with, uh, having the discussion about the, the GLP-1, the incretin, uh, medications that are all the rage and I'm sure they're popular in uh, India as well. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, gosh, I'm glad you asked. Um, so I don't prescribe them. Short answer. I will not prescribe them. My concerns about them are twofold. Is uh, and, and Robert Lustig puts these things very well and wherever he's interviewed and he speaks about these things, is if we are saying that diabetes and obesity are problems of insulin resistance, we need to also agree that they are not problems of GLP-1 deficiency. So even somebody who has obesity or uncontrolled diabetes is producing these, you know, um, these peptides. The reason that we see the benefit is that maybe there's so much insulin resistance that these peptides help to sort of amp up what insulin was trying to do in the first place. They also not just, they don't work only on insulin. They work on the brain and they signal to the brain satiety. Now. If, if we're looking for satiety, do we want to do injectable ways of achieving satiety? Do we want to do very expensive ways of doing that, which come with nasty side effects? I'll come to the side effects. Do we want to do it in a way where you have to be on these medications lifelong to keep getting the benefit? And my biggest thing is it causes loss of interest in food. I mean, at a common sense level, I love food. I would never want a medicine to make me lose interest in food. I remember with my second daughter, when I was going through morning sickness in pregnancy, I wanted to eat, but I had so much nausea that I started crying. I was like, I want to eat. And I can't, you know, <laughs> so even though it was from a healthy reason of hormone a response to pregnancy, I was so bothered that there's food in front of me. Others are eating and I cannot enjoy the meal because of this bizarre nausea experience. So that was my one time feeling nauseous to the point where I couldn't eat. But it's and so, you know, coming to these medications, uh, expense, need to be on it lifelong, uh, changes your relationship with food. And if I add the problems with it is the weight loss that we do see here, if we get technical when they've looked at these people on, on DEXA machines, body composition analysis, it's not all coming from fat. So, and in India, the, the way I explain it, you could say this to somebody anywhere in the world, it's not just for India, is if you were to trade one kilo of gold, a kilogram of gold for a kilogram of potatoes, would that be okay for you? Nobody would agree that it's the same trade. And so if you're losing weight on the weighing scale, if half of that loss is muscle, 
that's metabolically so harmful to you in the long run. But we as humans want instant gratification. I want weight loss now. I want the scale to move now. And I don't know if all the patients know exactly what they're signing up for. So people have come to me asking for my prescription. And they're like, I need it, my wedding. I, I, I'll only believe in my journey if I see weight loss first. Right. So they're like, if I just get some weight loss, I'll be motivated. And that's a that's a trap. That's a psychological trap is let's talk about what's not helping you be motivated without that number on the scale. And I just sit there and work with their thoughts. But patients have left because they want that prescription. And that's OK. The medicines are there uh, for a reason. I'm sure they might be life changing for some. I've had friends and family tell me that it was life changing to get on it and the nausea settled over time. And they're okay. And I see the noticeable weight loss. I hope and pray that it's not muscle loss. Um, and the gastroparesis, which has persisted in some people. So paralysis of the stomach. And that's one of the ways that you feel full all the time is whatever you ate just kind of sits there in the stomach and doesn't move as fast as it's supposed to on onward down to the lower digestion tract. That has turned into problems of just the food sitting there. And that can be very risky in some. So do no harm being my first oath is I'm not going to prescribe it. If I want to help you lose body fat and eat less food in your fasting window without the side effects and feel satiated with keeping your relationship with food healthy, we have enough lifestyle ways to do that. Yeah, well, you made a lot of good points. And of course, one of the arguments is that the, the low carb diet will restore uh, you, you know, your incretin function, your insulin resistance, it, it all approves uh, with diet. And uh, uh, basically, you could say the medication is mimicking, mimicking what the diet does. But of course, pharma is not going to make uh, a whole lot of money off of uh, diet. And uh, I love to hear what the people in the low carb community have to say about it, because um, most either love it or hate it. <laughs> It's, there's nothing there's nothing in between. And, um, you know, what we see here in the U.S., and it's probably the same around the world, is that, you know, the famous people were running to get the medication and people were running to the weight loss clinics to get the quick fix for the wedding or they needed to lose weight for some other reason. And uh, what the weight loss clinics we're doing with the medication is getting people right up to the maximum dosage. And there was a benefit where insurance was making it very inexpensive for the first six months or so. And then, you know, we, we hit six months, people lose all the weight, all the fat, all the muscle. And, and then uh, what do you do with it? <laughs> and so the point is that's, that's exactly the way not to do it. And right. uh, what I would tell you is, I, you know, I'm kind of a middle of the ground guy. I look for some common themes and uh, the audience may not know, but the class of drugs, uh, incretins have been around since 2005, uh, the first medication called Bieta. And oh. it's just uh, in recent years, it's become very popular because these new medications, semaglutide, liraglutide, are, are now more potent and they have a greater effect. And so... We, we actually use the medication, but we use it very carefully. We titrate up very slowly, never getting to the top dosage. And we insist that the patient has to comply with diet lifestyle and they have to go in the gym and they have to do both cardio and resistance. And uh, women are not excluded from resistance training. And uh, so that's our approach and uh, we're careful. Uh, we, we've had good results. I just had a patient with, uh, it was probably the second case of pancreatitis from uh, the medication. How about that? So um, he was he was really getting sick to his stomach every 24 to 48 hours after he gave himself the injection. So uh, we had to stop it and uh, he'll have to do it with diet and lifestyle. Right, exactly. Yeah, and, and speaking of Baeda, that reminds me, when I was practicing endocrinology in the U.S., uh, I was using a fair bit of it and I was getting great results. So it was my almost my second, you know, so of course it was the first injectable. I was not going to insulin as the first injectable. If people were maxed out on tablets for diabetes, my next step was Bieta in the U.S. And the tolerance to Bieta in my Caucasian patients was much higher than when I moved. I caught a plane, 
moved to India and started practicing in India, and I did the same practice algorithm, I noticed a lot more nausea and vomiting, a lot more of what Indians call acidity, acid reflux, a lot of dyspepsia, and just upper GI discomfort to the point where I just stopped prescribing by it. Although I swore by it in the US, I found population wise, I was seeing too much of pushback that the side effects were unbearable. So that makes me think that uh, um, the, the medication seems to work better on a, on a really good low carb diet rather than a, say a low carb vegetarian diet. And uh, that's been our experience that, it, you know, we tell people that uh, when they do eat, they have to eat the most nutrient dense food that they can find. And um, I think we've experienced the same that if people kind of uh, go off the rails and they start to cheat, they they pay for it with the medication. But the point of this is just to share our, our uh, different perspective regarding the medication. And uh, there's still going to be debate for time to come, I'm sure. For sure. Yeah. I think for me, the biggest question will be, what do we do about the conversation about getting off of these? Or is it a lifelong commitment we're taking that this is a lifelong prescription? I don't think we have long term data even about that. So the time will tell what's going to be the long term, you know, uh, plan for these drugs. Yeah. So, you know, I, I talk to patients that, um, you know, if if they have success with the diet and the medication, and and there's less of them as time goes on, then they become more metabolically healthy, and perhaps we can get them off medication with time and just, um, you know, continue with a healthy low carb Mediterranean diet, which which I think is a long term approach. Exactly. Yeah, it comes back down to there's no way out. Even if we prescribe it, the lifestyle change has to be the platform on on which we add the medications and prescriptions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, great, Roshni. Well, I think we had a really bad connection the whole way. It just cleaned up. I can see your video. So I'm going to cross my fingers. If the audio worked, that's good. But we may not have good uh, video. Oh, okay. I saw you clear through the whole time. So I'm hoping maybe when you replay it, you see it. Yeah. Well, we have to hope the recording works. (laughs) So great. Um, yeah. Any any last comments? Um, how can the audience find out more about you? So I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Dr. Roshni Sangani, and I'm on Instagram. Um, I'm on YouTube, and I'm coming out with a book hopefully by summer of 2024, where I'm going to talk about my experience as a doctor and the different patient, you know, journeys. You know, sort of step by step, what lifestyle changes can you make? to reverse the core problem in diabetes. Now in type one diabetes, it's not gonna be reversal or cure, but the insulin resistance component is going to be relevant for the reader who has either type two or type one diabetes, lifestyle change for diabetes. Well, great, Roshni. It's always a pleasure to talk and to our audience, thanks uh, very much for listening again. And don't forget to subscribe to our low carb conferences YouTube channel where you can uh, listen to more podcasts and also uh, our Low Carb Conferences lecture series, which is ongoing. So that's all for now. And um, thanks for listening. And uh, we'll talk again, Roshni. Thanks. Have a good night, Jeff.